Good afternoon, everyone, and it's a real pleasure to welcome Alberto Riverola to give us his seminar. So Alberto's been visiting for the last two months, and we've got him for another couple of weeks, and then he'll head back to Spain, where uh, he'll defend his PhD thesis. And that's what he's going to deliver his seminar on. Alberto is no stranger to me because he came to visit us in London, I think in 2016. We did some very nice work on establishing the emissivity of crystalline silicon solar cells. Uh, but Alberto has actually addressed a whole range of problems in building integrated photo photovoltaics. So it's a real pleasure to welcome you to give us a seminar, Alberto, on dielectric solar concentrators for building integration of hybrid photovoltaic thermal systems. So please, Alberto. So thank you, Ned, for the kind introduction, and thank you, everyone, for coming here today. So, um, yeah, as I said, um, the title of my presentation today is Dielectric Solar Concentrators. Ned said, basically, it covers all the work we've been doing during the last three years in Lleida regarding uh, building integrated PVT systems. Uh, as Ned said again, uh, during this time, I've been working on my PhD, and which I will hopefully finish soon. All the work I'm going to present today hasn't been performed by me, so that's why I would like to start first um, acknowledging my supervisor, Professor Daniel Chemisana, my colleague Alex Moreno, also our partners from the CNRS in France and from the Imperial College in London, from NETS Group, and also I would like to thank the Spanish government for the funding. The outline of my presentation today, I will start with the motivation, the reasons why we have performed all this work. Then I will go through all the modeling and design stages. I will talk about the electric liquids analysis, medium infrared emissivity model, modeling and optical design. And then I will finish with uh, experimental uh, simulation work and I will end with all the future work that we have to address now. Then, uh, I'd like to start with this fact that uh, buildings account for 40% of the total energy consumption and, uh, of and also account for 36% of the total CO2 emissions in the European Union. I don't know the exact numbers here in Australia, but I guess they won't be far from these ones. So, this just points that there is a huge potential to tackle the energy problems by uh, retrofitting or adapting existing buildings. So, um, steps have been taken already. In Europe, we have the Energy Performance of Buildings Directive with the 2020 objectives. So, we need to reduce by 20% the greenhouse emissions. We need to increase the renewable energy share by 20%. And we need to increase by 20% the energy efficiency. As you probably know, in a building we have different energy demands, which, which we can, well, we can say that we have electrical and thermal demands. We also have limited space and we need to have architectural integration in our buildings. So taking into account these constraints, we are aiming to uh, create nearly zero energy buildings. And what is meant by that? It's meant that the total energy used by the building on an annual basis should be roughly equal, that's an ideal case, to the renewable energy created on site. So that's our aim and taking into account the constraints that I said before, what we have done is we have designed a hybrid PVT system so that it produces uh, electrical and heat so that we can cover our demands. It's nicely integrated in a building facade and not only that, we want to potentially integrate our system in front of windows. So our system should be also a shading element like ordinary blinds and it has to, it's also a lighting control element. It has to allow the diffuse light to come in because we don't want to have a flat, a flat plate collector in front of our windows and there, there won't be light coming in. So as I said, we, we have chosen uh, PVT systems. So what's meant by the PVT system? PVT systems are these systems which also harvest the solar energy, which is not useful for photo, photo generation, so that they also produce heat. Um, and also they cool down the cells and they remove the waste heat. Uh, what are the advantages of uh, this type of systems? We have a high combined efficiency, we have a electrical efficiency of around 20% and, and thermal efficiency around 
And the good point is that we require a 60 less percent area than if we have a separated PV panel and a um, thermal collector. So that's key, in my opinion, for building integration. And the other fact that the other advantage is that we can reduce the operating temperatures of our solar cells so that we, we can have higher electrical efficiencies. And as I said before, we want uh, diffuse light coming in through our system, so that's why, that's why we have chosen to have a refractive low concentrating system, so that diffuse light is allowed to come in, we can have a lighting control uh, mechanism, we can we have selected low concentration because, as you probably know, low concentration means low tracking requirements and the, that means essentially low cost and e low concentration as well so that we can use standard and silicon solar cells and we can avoid expensive cells. And then if we have concentration, there is the cooling mechanism becomes more important so as you probably know there are different uh, cooling mechanisms. We can have passive cooling so that we can transmit heat by radiation, convection or conduction or we can have an active system where we have a fluid flowing through the cells by contact and it's cooling it or we can have the cells directly immersed in this liquid. We have uh, taken this approach because uh, we have a better temperature control, there is no contact resistance between our cells and our dissipator and also we have, uh, we can use those liquids as optical filters. We can select these wavelengths which are useful for photogeneration to be transmitted and we can use the other ones which, which only will heat up the cell to be absorbed in the liquid and we can avoid overheating problems. This is not something new. In the late 70s, uh, there were reported uh, several CPVT systems with the cells directly immersed in dielectric liquids, but none of those systems was uh, suitable for building integration applications. So yeah, that's the motivation of our work. And then we can move on to the next step we have uh, done towards achieving, towards developing our system and it's uh, we, ha we have performed a literature review so that we have found several candidates, several dielectric liquids candidates where we can immerse our solar cells. So we have come with these uh, candidates. The ionized water is the one which has the best, the best electrical and thermal properties for our purpose. We also have alcohols like isopropyl and isobutyl alcohol. They, these have a really good a operating a really good operating range between melting and boiling temperatures and then we have glycerol some some authors have uh, used it but it has a really high viscosity so it's not really good and then we have dimethyl sulfoxide which has also good thermal and low viscosity which is good none of those liquids uh, its properties are not affected if we are operating under 80 degrees but several um, Several problems have been reported, like glycerin becomes yellowish with time, the ionized water may oxidize uh, our metallic components, but the emitters should be fine. Then alcohols may degrade, may degrade polymeric materials or sealants, so you really have to take care which, which materials are those alcohols in contact. And yeah, the other problem is that the non-alcohol liquids have uh, melting points at temperatures higher than zero degrees. So depending on where you plan to install uh, these collectors, you may need to mix your those liquids with alcohols or with other additives. First, we have analyzed the optical properties of those liquids. The first thing we are aiming to is to reduce the Fresnel losses. So considering that we have an encapsulant glass with an index of refraction of 1.5, then we have our liquid and finally we have the enter reflective coating that for silicon solar cells is usually silicon nitride which is around 2 so then we are ideally we want our liquids to have an, an, index, an index of refraction between 1.5 up 2 so that we can reduce the Fresnel losses. We have just calculated this uh, three slab system, this simple three slab system with normal incidence for a uh, wavelength of uh, 580 nanometers and we found that the power loss if we don't have a liquid in the cavity is of 18 percent and if we however if we add the these liquids we can see that this power loss is 
greatly reduced, and the one which is achieving the the best performance is dimethyl sulfoxide, but really there are not big, big differences between them. And also, as I said before, uh, using optical filters we can tailor the spectrum that is actually arriving to our cells. And what do we want? We want to have high transparency in the range of PV production, and we, we also want to have high absorptance out of this range. So looking at this graph here, we have the standard AM 1.5D spectrum, which I'm sure you, all of you are familiar with it. And then we have the spectral response for several PV technologies. So we have crystalline silicon solar cells, which, in which we are interested right now. We have CIGS and we have gallium arsenide. Uh, if we get the product of the spectral responses and of our spectrum, we get the spectral current. So for mat for PV cells with uh, lower band gaps, we have a much broader uh, spectral current, and for those with higher band gaps, we have um, a shorter spectral current. So, in order to find those wavelengths where we want, where we really want to have a high transmittance, we have defined an indicator which is called the ideal filter window, uh, which is defined as the minimum spectral bandwidth, which comprises 75% of the total spectral current that we have in our graph. So this, is, this indicator not only depends on our cells, but also depends in the, in the spectrum that is coming. So, uh, in order to stress that, we have uh, using the smart relative model, here you have four different spectra. So the first one is the reference spectrum, and then in spectrum A, we have increased the air mass. The air mass is the distance that the sun rays traverse through the atmosphere before reaching the Earth's surface. And we have increased it to a value of three. This, um, this is the value to which the spectrum is most sensitive, and then in spectrum B, we have increased the aerosol optical math, which measures the radiative strength of aerosols, and it's also really important for our spectrum. And finally, in spectrum C, we have increased both of them. The precipitable water is kept constant because its impact is uh, almost one order of magnitude lower. So here I, I have a plot which shows the ideal finger window for crystalline silicon solar cells in green, for uh, CIGS in blue, and for gallium arsenal in red. Uh, there are four lines which indicate which one, each one is for each spectrum. So as we can see, for cells with a high band gap, like gallium arsenide, our ideal filter window is really not sensitive to the spectral contact, whereas we can see that for cells which are much uh, broader spectral response, we can see that increasing, especially the aerosol optical depth, we can see that our ideal filter window has a red shift. So that only points that we need to address uh, where we want to have high transmittance, really thinking carefully where we are, how is the spectrum that we are getting. So now that we know where we want to have high transmittance, the next thing that we have done is actually measuring the transmittance of our candidates. So we have, we set this experiment, we were using a 10 millimeters path length optical, optical cubettes, and we came out with the results. These are the um, transmission curves for our, for all our, sorry, for all, for all our liquids. Sorry, and also you have the ideal filter window for the reference spectrum and for the most demanding case, which is spectrum C, which uh, had higher mass and high aerosol optical depth. So basically we want to have high transmittance in this range. So if we take a look to the graph, we can see that the methyl sulfoxide and the alcohols are the ones achieving the highest transmittance there. For the reference case, we can, we can see that the ionized water is performing well, but it has a big dip at around 950 nanometers, which makes it not very suitable for the most demanding case. And uh, out of the range, we want to have low, low transmission. And in this range, the ones that are absorbing more are the ionized water and glycerol. So we can see that we have ones that are performing well for transmittance and others that are performing well for absorptance. So we thought, OK, we can mix them, and maybe we can have them all. And that's what we have done here is the same graph, but in this case, we have a mixture with, with the volumetric fraction indicated, and we have mixtures of the ionized water and isopropyl alcohol, mixture of the ionized water and dimethyl sulfoxide, 
and mixtures of glycerol and IPA. And from here we can see that now we have a reasonable transmittance for our ideal filter window and also we have uh, high absorptance out of the range. So from this analysis we concluded that our best candidates were a mix mixtures of the ionized water plus IPA or a mixture of the ionized water plus dimethyl sulfoxide. Then the next part was uh, what about the thermal properties? What do we want from those liquids? We want to we wanted high specific heat and high thermal conductivity so that we can have we can maximize our thermal exchange. We wanted a low uh, coefficient of expansion we, so we can avoid thermal stress and obviously we want to have an appropriate range of operating temperatures between melting and boiling points. From the graphs that I showed you before regarding the transmittance, here is just how much is transmitted in the range that is not useful for photogeneration. So it's clearly seen here that the one which is transmitting more is dimethyl sulfoxide. We don't want transmission here, so we thought that 25% uh, here is more than we want. And it's clear the one that is clearly performing better here is the ionized water. And the last thing regarding the thermal properties is we we also want to have a high liquid density and low viscosity so that we can maximize the heat removal with low pressure losses. In order to, mm, to compare our liquids, we, we have performed um, an easy calculation. So we have estimated the pumping power for a one meter square flat plate collector. So if we take a look to the graph on the left, we have fixed our delta T to seven degrees Celsius. We have on the y axis the pumping power, which we want it to be as low as possible. And then we have on our x axis our dissipated power, which we want it to be maximum. So we can clearly see here that the ionized water is the one which is actually performing better and also the methyl sulfoxide is performing well. The case that we have in the right is similar to what I just said but in this case we have fixed our dissipated power and instead of having the dissipated power in the x-axis we have the temperature difference. So we are aiming for a lower pumping powers and a high delta T. So again we have the, the ionized water which is actually performing the best as expected. Yeah, so from this analysis, the substances, the dielectric liquids which uh, have adequate melting points, high transmitters in the ideal filter window, how high absorptance out of it, good thermal characteristics and low pumping power. The, from this analysis, we concluded that uh, the ionized water IPA or mixtures of the ionized water plus IPA or the ionized water plus dimethyl sulfoxide were the ones uh, that, are, that were performing better, but um, if we plan to use the ionized water or the ionized water plus dimethyl sulfoxide, uh, we may think about uh, mixing them with, with some additives because the melting point is not good, it's zero or above zero, so that may be a big problem. Yeah, the next step uh, we performed was um, calculating the medium for the emissivity modeling. We performed this work while I was visiting a student in NETS group, so you may have heard about that already. So I will just quickly go through it. Uh, why is it important, the relative, the medium for the emissivity modeling? It's important because it's key for determining our operating temperatures and perform uh, heat proper heat transfer calculations. And based on that, we can engineer our systems either to have radiative cooling or we can also go to the opposite and we can try to enable our PVT systems to operate at higher temperatures, going for a low emissivity coating or other approaches. So the first thing we did was actually measuring what the emissivity of crystalline silicon solar cells was. Uh, in order to do that, we use an integrating sphere and an FTR. So depending on where you place your sample, you can measure reflectivity, transmissivity, and using each of uh, relation, you can get the absorptivity or the emissivity. And then we thought we wanted as well to model it. So yeah, we thought about how uh, the light propagates through our solar cells and we have the texture which, which is actually bringing some problems. We, we have different approaches. We can use ray tracing, but it's actually computationally costly. We can use full wave optical model, which is prohibitive. And 
we have different uh, dimensions through our solar cells. We have the, the wafer thickness, which is around 200 micrometers, the texture features, which are around 4 uh, micrometers, and we have coatings, which are uh, around 50 nanometers. So we solved this by using the optus formalism, which, which was developed by the people from the Fraunhofer in Germany. Uh, it basically uh, breaks our cell in three different parts. So we have on one side our textures, the front and the back texture, and on the other side we have um, our wafer. So the key point here is how to actually get our redistribution, redistribution matrices, which are B and C. Uh, these matrices basically descri describe how light is scattered after the interaction after the interaction with our texture. So we obtain these matrices by a mix of ray tracing and wave optics to take into account our small coatings. And by doing this, sorry, we found that uh, an encapsulated crystal. crystal Silicon solar cells were actually good relative emitters due to the high dop layers and due to the, mm, the light trapping which comes from the texture. Uh, this graph that we have on the bottom right is actually an, an extension of the really nice work that Sandbergen did up to 1.5 micrometers. So we, we extended his calculations up to 15 microns. And as I said, we can see that uh, the emissivity is quite high, up to 15 microns. And then we thought, uh, what happens if we have an encapsulated cell? And that's what we got. We, we position at top of our cell a uh, three millimeters low, low iron soda lime glass. And we can see how the, the graph changes. Now the high the, our cells are again highly emissive, but in this case, the emissivity comes from the highly emissive cover glass. And as it has been previously reported, we have an emissivity dip around micrometers around 10 micrometers, which comes from the polarity of resonance. So we concluded that uh, an encapsulated and encapsulated crystalline silicon solar cells were actually good radiative emitters, so that they are well already well suited for <coughs> radiative cooling. However, the thermal efficiency will be limited uh, based on these uh, radiative losses. Yeah, so moving on, um, based on the previous result, then now we can address the optical design of our PVT module. And we had a set of requirements and goals. We wanted uh, actually to integrate our system in, in a building, and potentially over facades. We want to have low medium concentration for the reasons I previously said. We want to have our cells directly immersed in a dielectric liquid. And our goals are that we want to partially cover our electricity and heat demands. And we want to have reasonable performance and a reasonable cost as well. So now I'm coming back to the architectural image that I showed you before. Um, our mo modules are based on a um, cylindrical BK7 glass. We have chosen BK7 because it's a well-known optical glass. It has a good resistance to alcohols. And inside of our chassis, we have an, um, an inner cavity where, where we have our circulating dielectric fluid. And yeah, we have chosen this cylindrical shape because you can track the solar altitude in a relative simple way by rotation. And we have also foreseen another movement which actually controls the vertical distance between different modules so that we can avoid shading and we can implement a lighting control uh, strategy. Uh, the solar azimuth remains untracked in this system, taking benefit from the linear concentrations that we get from cylinder cylindrical systems. And yeah, just uh, the diameter of our cylindrical collector is 60 millimeters. And yeah, obviously in the north hemisphere, this collector should be in the east-west direction, facing south, and here it will be facing north. Yeah, so the we also, uh, what we did basically is we wanted to optimize the interface between our chassis and our um, inner cavity so that we can focus all the incident uh, sunlight towards our PV cell. And we did that by modeling this interface as a freeform B spline. 
And then by a full ray tracing algorithm, we perform a, a multi-objective optimization for geometrical concentrations ranging from 10 to 20, and with the goals of having the maximum optical efficiency and the maximum irradiance uniformity, and this for two dielectric liquids, deionized water and IPA. So, doing that, we obtain the following results. So, as I said, we have two dielectric liquids, and we have done three geometrical concentrations for, for the two dielectric liquids. And, yeah, we have uh, the first parameter I'm going to talk about is the weighted optical efficiency. We have defined it as the, mm, is the optical efficiency, which takes in into account the silicon spectral response bandwidth. So, you can get this efficiency by by dividing the current that you are getting in, or in your cell compared to the one that you would be getting if your optical efficiency would be one. So in this way, we can take into account, uh, since we are trying to filter out those wavelengths that we are not interested in, to, we can actually take into account it in this with this uh, weighted optical efficiency. So we can see that for the ionized water, we get an efficiency of, of around 76% for all of the for all the concentrations, and with IPA we get an optical efficiency which is five points higher, which is around 81. Uh, then we have the non-uniformity coefficient, which is uh, for the ionized water is good for all the concentrations. However, for IPA, for concentrations higher than 10 we observe an out the Gaussian shape and our uniformity was somehow worse. And the last parameter is the acceptance angle, which is defined as the misalignment angle in the track di direction by which we lose 10% uh, efficiency. So obviously we want it to be as high as possible because that's, this is directly re related with our tracking cost. So we want it to be as high as possible. And for the ionized water, we were getting reasonable values up to a concentration of 15, whereas for IPA, uh, only for 10, we were getting a good value. So I, I just want to show you briefly the, um, the concentration profile over our cells. So this is for a geometric concentration of 10, and given that our diameter is 60 millimeters, our cells are of 6 millimeters. So then you can see that the uh, optimization is doing its job quite nicely because it's quite uniform and this is how the misalignment angle affects in the track direction. So uh, this is directly related with the acceptance angle so you can see that in this case it's quite linear and then this allows you maybe to play a bit uh, to play of focus if you want some direct light to come inside your building. Then, what's the main difference between the two systems? Why we are getting higher efficiency with isopropyl alcohol? This is directly related with uh, the transmittance that I showed you before. Uh, actually, IPA is transmitting 92% of what it's getting uh, for the spectral range of the silicon solar cell, and the ionized water is only transmitting 86%. This can be clearly seen in this graph. So actually, I call it the spectral normal efficiency, but it's, uh, it's the transmittance. So we have as a dashed line the, um, the spectral current uh, for silicon solar cells, and then we can see that IPA is actually transmitting more from 700 nanometers on, and that's why uh, the optical efficiency is higher. However, uh, for wavelengths higher than 1,100 nanometers, we can say that we can see that um, IP, IPA is transmitting more of what we want it to transmit. Yeah, so the last question regarding our optical design is what happens with the Anfrag azimuth angle? Uh, these contours that I have here, basically what uh, it's indicating we have, for every ray we have in the y-axis the azimuth angle, and then we have in the um, x-axis the ray's initial x-coordinate, so we can quickly observe which rays are more efficient, and as well as its logic, the central rays are actually more efficient. You have lower incident angles, you have lower path lengths through your system, so that's why your system is always more efficient in the center. And as you increase the um, azimuth angle, the, the extremal rays, which are close to the edges, uh, start getting some total internal reflection, so that's why you see here that the efficiency is zero, 
and for angles higher, for azimuth angles higher than 55, uh, there is a there is no total internal reflection for the central rays, but there is a strong field uh, curvature, so the rays start to miss the target, except the central ray. And for IPA, there is a similar behavior, but in this case, uh, it's performing reasonable up to 60 degrees. So it's somehow uh, better, as we can see in the next uh, slide. Uh, the next uh, slide is basically if you integrate the previous contour plots for every azimuth angle, then you get the optical efficiency as a function of the azimuth angle. That's what we have here. And we can say we can see that um, up to 30 degrees, both systems uh, keep a reasonable optical efficiency. Then we see a big drop, but up to 40 degrees, we have yet, we have still a performance of an optical efficiency higher than 50%. So the next step was uh, actually building our prototypes and testing if our models were right. So instead of using BQ7 for our prototypes, we will use PMMA so that we can um, so that we can build our prototypes in our lab. So we were using uh, CNC machining and polishing processes to obtain our our cylinders and we also perform optimizations considering the optical constants of PMMA so that we can have the optical, the optimum interface. But since the transmittance for the, PV, for the silicon spectral response is similar, we were getting similar uh, optical efficiencies. And what we did to validate our model was to actually uh, compare our profiles widths, our simulated profile widths, with our experimental widths, and we saw that uh, the agreement was quite uh, good and also we measure we trace some IV curves so that we can obtain the experimental optical efficiencies and we were getting an experimental efficiency of 73.5 for the ionized water and 76.5 for isopropyl alcohol so we were quite happy with our initial prototypes and yeah the last step we did is we want actually to check how our systems perform in a real building but before doing that we are we miss our the thermal characteris characterization of our of our collectors so that's the next thing we did we characterize thermally our collectors by means of a cfd model and by an experimental validation so Basically, what we wanted uh, to have is a CFD model, which is which we are sure it works. So, in order to validate it, we mm, connected our um, PV module to a um, power source, and we were basically using our our model as a dissipator, so that we were using rock wool to approximate to have adiabatic conditions, and then we we had similar boundary conditions in our cfd model and then we ran uh, transient and steady state measurements to check whether or not our results were close and we had really good agreement so by doing this we validated our model and then we obtained our thermal characteristic curve under a wind here i'm showing it under a wind velocity of two meters per second and yeah the then we have um, the wind velocity of two meters per second. Um, we were taking this velocity into account in our simulation by using uh, the Churchill and Bernstein correlation. And we also performed some experimental measurements by placing our module in a two axis tracker, measuring inlet, outlet temperatures, windlet, ve windlet velocity, and irradiance. And you can see the points here, which are uh, from, from experimental measurements. and we were also quite happy with the agreement, but the point um, we realized that we have a high uh, thermal loss coefficient with range which is uh, between 13 and 14 watts per meter square per Celsius uh, grade. So yeah, then we now have our modules uh, characterized from the optical point of view and from the thermal point of view so now we are ready to perform our dynamic simulation and from the things that i said before we know that uh, this collector has two main limitations the first one is that uh, we want to avoid shading between them the higher the solar height is the higher the interspace between all our modules has to be so that's why uh, we were 
uh, we set that, that this constraint so that we want to have latitudes higher than 35 so that we don't need to have really big spaces between modules. And the next one, as I said just a couple of minutes ago, we have a heat, high heat loss coefficient. So we were focused on places with mild winters and hot summers. And in the Copenhagen climate classification, this is the CSS climate. So based on that, we choose uh, these three locations that I'm pointing here, Lisbon, Barcelona and Genoa to perform our dynamic simulation. Both of them have latitudes higher than 35 and have the weather we were uh, looking at. First of incorpor uh, before in, um, first we have calculated we have chosen and start and building a two story single family house which has an habitable area of 145.5 meters square and before uh, incorporating our modules we wanted to know what the demands of these buildings are so uh, we did that by assuming that uh, the domestic hot water in this building is provided by a gas boiler and the space heating and cooling demands are provided by a reversible heat pump. By doing this, we calculated all using Francis, the tram build uh, tool and the domestic hot water calc. And using this software, we obtain all the demands. So here I have a table with all of them domestic hot water, space heating, space cooling electri and electricity demands and one that we have once we have these demands fixed now we want to see how our system is able to cover these demands and that's what we have done this is a, actually a picture of our system incorporated in the building so you can see uh, how the collectors look when we have the maximum instead space between them and how do they look with we have the, this space set to minimum. Basically when it's set to minimum it covers the whole uh, height of our window and yeah we had 21 rows per window with a total area of 16.7 meters square and with an electrical power of 2.5 kilowatts. Yeah, then how it's our topology in this building. Basically, we have our PVT collectors and we have regarding, I'm first going to talk about the thermal circuit. We have uh, our PVT collectors that uh, with our dielectric liquids circulating and then we have a stratified tank with two heat exchangers to maximize our, our heat exchange. And then uh, this stratified tank uh, aims to cover the domestic hot water demands and the space heating demands by using a radiant floor. And also I would like to mention that the auxiliary heater that we were using, the gas heater that we, the gas boiler that we were using before, it remains in place just to cover uh, domestic hot water demands in, ca in case we don't have a enough thermal production. And this is regarding the thermal production and uh, regarding the electrical production. Uh, this uh, energy goes in order, um, is utilized to cope with the appliances and lighting demand and also with the space heating and cooling through powering the heat pump with the PV production. The, um, yeah, the um, a strategy that we have followed here is the, the so-called self-consuming connected to the power grid with backup batteries. So that means that uh, if we have demand and we have production, our production goes directly to our demand. If we don't have demand but we have production, then we have some batteries and we are charging them. And in case that we don't, we don't have uh, charge our batteries and we don't have production, we, we have uh, still the connection to the, power, the public power grid. Yeah, so using this topology, we can uh, now uh, evaluate how the domestic hot water demands are met by our collectors. So for the three cities, we can see that during summer, the solar fraction is quite high. And during winter in Lisbon and Barcelona, we get it's still solar fractions higher than 50%, but for Genoa it's somehow lower because it has a higher demands. This is regarding domestic hot water. Regarding space heating and cooling demands, we can see the, um, 
the space cooling demands in blue and the space heating demands in red. And then we have the thermal production which uh, goes through the radiant floor. And then we have the, the heat pump in green which is powered by the PV electrical production. Uh, so we can see again that we have a really good um, solar fraction during summer, but for Barcelona and for Lisbon, and again for, Geo for Genoa, the uh, space cooling demands are higher, so our solar fraction is not that good. And in winter, the same trend as before, uh, we have uh, solar fractions higher than 40% in Lisbon and Barcelona, but for Genoa is lower. And the last thing I'm going to show is the elect how well we cover the electricity demands. This graph is related to the previous one, but in this case we have the heat pump demand, but we have also the appliances and lighting demands. So that's why the solar fractions are lower, but we were quite happy that in Lisbon and Barcelona the system is uh, almost able to cope with 40% of all the electricity demands. And for Genoa the performance is uh, in the limit it's yeah, the limit of achieving a reasonable performance. So uh, our future work is to improve uh, the thermal efficiency. So there is a great potential to reduce convective and radiative losses. And then we want to actually test our system over a long period of time, over a real building or a full scale testing unit. And we were also looking uh, to incorporate solar cells with lower temperature coefficient and higher cell efficiencies. So yeah, that was all. Thank you everyone for your attention. Thank you very much, Alberto, for a really nice talk. We've got time for one quick question. Have we got a quick question? Yes, Anita. So in your system, you try to cool the cell down, and then you still need to um, provide a heat uh, cooling into the building. Have you thought about using the system on the roof, and instead of immersing in liquid uh, dielectric, you just run water and then cool the building down using using your system. Does it make sense? Um, we can integrate this building over a roof as well, and yeah, that's why we thought about integrating it over a windows, over in front of windows, because this is the most demanding case. So that's why I'm focus more integrating it over facades, but we can as well uh, integrate it over a roof. But I, I don't get the last part of your question. So you were talking about other type of system or the same system just over the roof? Probably different system, but we can talk more about it. Yeah, 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 for sure. There, there is possibility to have, yeah, there is a big opportunity to have other kind of PVT systems over your roof. Yeah, that's for sure. Okay, well, thank you so much, Alberto. I'm sorry we're short of time today. Uh, folks, it's been a great talk. Thank you, Alberto. Thanks for everyone coming. Let's give Alberto another round of applause.